Natural oils are really gaining popularity, and for good reason. They're very safe to use, they provide a nice close to the wood finish, and they also provide some good water resistance. But if you apply them incorrectly, you could find yourself in a very sticky situation. The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Typebond. Now, let's be honest, I know some of you are really not interested in all the testing and explanation that's going to be in this video, so let's uh, spoil the ending, and I'll show you what I think is the most effective way to apply a natural drying oil like tongue oil or boiled linseed oil or any of these new mixtures that we have access to. Now, the product I'm going to use is Bumble Shoots. This is just a mixture of tongue oil and citrus solvent. I don't know their exact mixture, but it, it seems like it's about 50-50, and I just have a blue shop towel. It's a paper towel that is lint-free. Just going to get a little in there. You can see this stuff is pretty thin. Load up the rag and then I'm going to start spreading it onto this little test board of walnut. Circular motions seem to work really well. I'm going to drive the finish down into the wood, into the pores, looking for those dry spots and I want to just give everything uh, the wet look. Now what I don't have is any standing material here. Right? There's no finish pooling it's all just soaking in and getting rubbed in. And I got most of the board done with just one shot there. So apply a little bit more to finish it off. And by the way, with natural finishes like this, with an oil, you can sand the board as high as you want, really. Um, you can go to 220, 320. Yeah, 220, 221, whatever it takes. Whatever your preference is, but you don't usually have to go higher than 180 if you don't want to. Okay, now you might think that that's done and you would leave it at this point. I would not. I would go back and take a dry part of my rag or a fresh rag and I'm going to go back and buff everything off. You really don't want any standing material on the surface. Now dry time on this is usually pretty long, at least 12 hours. If you could wait 24 hours between coats, even better. So I would come back to this the next day, apply another light coat in the same way. All of my coats will be applied with the same exact methodology, giving a good amount of dry time in between. Now, if it's something like a cutting board, a spoon, a kitchen item, usually two to three coats is about all I'm gonna do. And then from that point, you do maintenance coats as you need a couple times a year. If I'm doing a piece of furniture, if I've got the patience, I might go up to five coats. And that's the thing, it's patience. You really have to wait for that dry time between and take your time with it. It almost becomes a hobby in and of itself, uh, finishing with oils like this. So you gotta know what you're in for before you get into this territory. Now remember, I mentioned that this Bumble Shoots product is pre-diluted with citrus solvent, and that makes it thin and very easy to work and quick to absorb in the surface. You might be interested in something with no solvents whatsoever that's 100% tongue oil like this stuff, but look at the difference. So much thicker, right? Now, that doesn't mean you can't use this. You could certainly spread it around. It's just harder to spread doesn't absorb as readily, um, but there is a trick. You can actually heat this stuff up. So if you have a hot plate in the shop, you can use that to warm it up and that will accelerate its penetration into the surface, right? So just be aware if you wanna go completely solvent free, you can still use 100% tongue oil like this. And it's the same application. You're just wiping enough to make the surface appear wet and then wiping off as much excess as you possibly can. Now, if I were a different kind of content producer, only interested in views, I might call this video something like, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> which always gets views. But the truth is you may not be doing it wrong. If you have a method that works for you, I'm not here to change your mind. If you are someone who has problems with oil finishes, or maybe you're new and you just want the most trouble-free way to apply that finish, this is the video for you. So if that sounds like your jam, stick around. Maybe we could rub each other with some tongue oil and uh, get this party started. Now you might recall last year I did a video on using tongue oil and citrus solvent as a good alternative food safe finish, but in that video I didn't actually talk too much about the application method. Well since then I've heard from some people who've tried it who have had issues. One such person was Jeff when he wrote in and said that he used tongue oil on a cutting board and a couple weeks later had these white streaks and spots. Now these spots are actually oil that's leaching back out to the surface where it finally cures and has that whitish color to it. So my first question for Jeff was, how did you apply it? And sure enough, Jeff used the flooding method. The flooding method generally looks something like this. You're usually taking a brush of some kind or a rag and putting on a lot of material. You're really soaking it on there and letting the wood drink up as much as it wants. In a lot of cases, we're going to reapply as we see dry spots develop. 
Now, I've done this in the past too, but the more times I do it on the more species of wood, just with more experience, I start to realize that maybe that's not the best way to go. But we're gonna keep applying. Anytime we see a dry spot develop, we're gonna go back, put more wood, <laughs> more finish on there. <laughs> Too late to put more wood on there. All right now we might actually leave this for an hour and then come back and wipe off the excess, but I think you get the idea. Okay. Let's pretend it's an hour later and we'll wipe all that off. Now, is Jeff crazy for doing it this way? Absolutely not. In fact, many, uh, I would even say most of these companies recommend the flooding method for the application. Hope's Pure Tongue Oil says apply using a cloth or brush, then allow one hour to penetrate. Next, using an absorbent cloth, remove all excess from the surface. They also recommend waiting 12 hours between applications. Milk Paints Half and Half says apply to the surface, allow to soak in. If all material absorbs, then by all means, reapply. Continue until material puddles on the surface, allow to stand for 20 to 40 minutes between coats. Wipe off any excess material with a clean cloth. And even one of my favorites, Bumble Shoots, recommends more of a flooding method, but having spoken with the owners, I think they're changing their label to include advice for a more sparingly coated surface. So that's good. So why do I find the flooding method potentially problematic? Well, first, it's wasteful. When you put that much finish onto the surface and you wind up, even if you wait an hour, you wind up wiping it back, you're gonna get a lot of finish trapped in the rags that just end up in the garbage. Uh, you also, if you use a sponge applicator, there's a ton of oil stuck in this thing that's eventually just gonna end up in the garbage. The other thing is you wind up, especially with something like an end grain board, you can see how the finish is peeking through on the back end. That means that there is actually finish throughout this board. And if you keep applying it, keep soaking it in, this will be saturated. And it seems like it would be a good thing, but I find it pretty much unnecessary. When you seal the surface of wood for a food item or a piece of furniture, it's just the surface I'm really concerned about. And once it's sealed, it's sealed. Think about it this way. If you have a bunch of straws, we'll use that analogy again, and you seal it at the top, essentially you're capping it off. Does it matter what happens below that point if it's capped off properly? No, it doesn't. So why would you want to trap oil down deep into the material? I don't really think it adds a whole lot to the situation. So wastefulness, not a great thing. Now the second reason is essentially what happened to Jeff, where the oil just kind of leaches back to the surface and you wind up with those oil droplets or little white spots on the surface later on. And you could really finish it as good as you want, wipe everything away and you come back the next day and that can happen. Now, it definitely depends on the species of wood, the porosity of the wood, how much oil you applied, how much time between coats, the temperature that the board is stored in. There's a lot of factors at play, so you may never see this, but it is a possibility. And flooding is something that uh, basically encourages that to happen. And third, you may end up having curing issues. Now let's take a second to talk about curing. Conventional wisdom with these natural drying oils says you want to go about 24 hours between coats. It takes 24 hours to dry, but it may take weeks to cure. Remember, drying and curing are two different things. Drying just simply means it's dry to the touch. I don't feel anything wet on my fingers when I touch it, but a full cure is something that takes a lot longer for that oil to completely polymerize. Now, my personal experience does jive with the conventional wisdom in terms of cure times and reapplication, but if I apply with flooding methods, all bets are off because flooding puts oil on top of oil. And the reason that's a problem is because oil needs access to oxygen to cure. I mean, this is why the oil in this can isn't gonna cure over a couple of days. I've cut off its supply of oxygen. Now, eventually, as oxygen leaks in the can, you might, and that's why things go bad, right? You might wind up having that finished cure. But as it stands now, it's not going to. So when we continually apply coats and we flood it on there, there's an excess of oil being brought to the wood, we could effectively extend the cure time. This is also why we can't apply oils like polyurethanes and varnishes. We can't just leave it on the surface without wiping the excess, because if you do that and you put oil on top of uncured oil, you end up with a sticky mess. That's what this is. This is two coats that have been just kind of applied. The first coat soaked in all the way. The second coat stayed on the surface and has shiny spots and dull spots. The shiny spots are where the wood essentially was sealed up enough that it wouldn't take any more oil, and now it's just a gross sticky mess. This is bad news, so of course, always wipe the excess. But this is why the flooding method sort of contributes to potential curing problems. Hi there. I know you're kind of in the middle of watching a video and stuff, but I wanted to tell you about a new course that we're gonna have in the Wood Whisperer Guild, and this one is taught by me. 
In this course, we'll cover the design and execution of a large dining table and matching bench. This course is a little different than our typical guild courses as the focus is less about the build and more about the design. It's something of an experimental design that I wasn't 100% sure would even work. Spoiler alert, it did. But this course will show you my thought process and struggles as I go from design concept into template construction, then into the actual build. We'll then take what we've learned from the table and apply that to a matching bench, and we'll take that opportunity to try some alternative techniques as well. So the course launches at the end of February, and you have until then to get the course at the pre-order price. It's super low right now, so head over to TWWGuild.com and check it out. Now, it's one thing for me to tell you that there could be potential curing problems, but it would be a whole nother thing for me to show you proof and I've got a heat gun and I'm not afraid to use it. So something I've discovered primarily because I'm weird and this is the stuff I find fun, is that if you hit a surface that's been oiled with a lot of heat, you can actually cause the oil and the uncured oil to come back up to the surface. So this is a freshly oiled board. This will be no surprises. I'm just gonna hit it with some heat and show you how the oil droplets come back to the surface. We gotta let this thing warm up a little bit first. Okay, here we go. See all that oil? Comes right back up. All right, now this should be interesting. This is an end grain cutting board. We flooded on a couple of coats on this side. We wiped sparingly on this side. So we're gonna heat treat both and see what happens. I'm gonna do a 10 count for both sides with the same temperature and try to keep the same distance for the heat gun just to see what we get. So let this warm up. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Look at that. Definitely looks like the walnut being a little bit more porous. That's also the species where uh, the oil went all the way through the board. But you can see that's where a lot of that uncured oil is hiding out. Now it's pretty easy to just rub that back in, but obviously there's a lot of uncured oil even after several weeks inside this board. All right, let's try the other side. Here we go. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll give it a little bit more time. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right. Maybe if I squint real hard, I think I see a little shiny spot there, but not much to speak of. So I would, you know, think of this as pretty much cured at this point. Now here's another test board. This is of course a long grain cutting board, uh, finished in the same exact way. We have a flooded side here, a sparingly applied side there. I do wanna point out another thing that can sometimes happen, uh, which is not always great, is that the pores get a little bit darker with the flooding method because I think those pores hold on to that oil, essentially staying wet a little bit longer, and as it soaks in, you just get darker coloring. Now, I mean, maybe that's an advantage. You might like the way that looks, but if you compare this side on these walnut pieces to this side, you can see, well, hopefully you can see a little bit of a darker uh, color around those pores. So just a minor point. All right, let's do the same 10 second test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, hopefully you can see with the light reflection, uh, both the maple and the walnut are letting go of some oil, definitely some came to the surface. And it's crazy because if you were to feel this and given the timeline we worked with, you would think that this is cured. Clearly not though, there's still oil in there. All right, let's check out the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, I don't see anything. I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. One, two, Three, four, five. Nothing. Not getting anything at all. All right, now things are about to get real interesting here. So the first version of this video, I had different boards selected for my samples that just didn't work out. This one has been finished for a couple of months. So I have a flooded side here and a uh, sparingly applied side here. This is white oak. And let's just see if there's any uncured oil still in there. And I mean months, guys. This has been here for a little while. 
Here we go. Now I'm not even gonna count because I just wanna see if I can get any oil to come up. <laughs> Look at that. There it is. I don't know if you can see that, but in the darker, deeper grain where those pores are generally a little bit more open, I do see some spotting of oil. Wow. I honestly kind of didn't expect that, especially for a flat sawn board like this, but these pores in some species can be wide open and they just take a lot of oil. All right, let's try this side. Same thing, I'm gonna give it a torture test and a lot of time. Real curious if I can get any to show up. Okay, I think that's enough. And I don't really see anything there. Nothing to speak of. Now, thinking logically about this, you might assume that perhaps the flooded boards are more protected, right? Maybe they've got more water resistance or abrasion resistance. Well, for natural oils, we're not getting a whole lot in the way of abrasion or heat resistance, but we will get uh, sort of a waterproof surface or close to waterproof. So could the saturated boards repel water better than the ones that just receive light coats? Well, let's test it. Now, I can't really test this in a true scientific way. All of these samples will probably lose an equal amount to evaporation, and some may absorb minute amounts. I just can't really measure how much water is left over. But I just wanna see if there's anything notable as we drop the same amount of water onto each sample, and then just see what happens. Just as a control, I've got two unfinished cutting boards. Just see what happens there. All right, let's give these things, I don't know, 30 minutes. All right, so it's actually been a full hour. I had an unexpected guest stop by and I couldn't get to this. So let's take a look at the controls first. You can see a good amount of water has soaked into the grain. Obviously after an hour, you know, we didn't get all of it to soak in, but uh, you could see the water staining around it and some absorption definitely occurred there. So let's get the excess. Okay, pretty obvious. Now the end grain control, I don't know, it's kind of surprising. I think I would have expected it to absorb more. I do believe it has absorbed quite a bit, but you can see there's still plenty of this stuff on the surface. So let's get that up there. And you can see that obviously did absorb quite a bit. I'm gonna flip it over because I'm curious if any went through. Oh, yep, there you go. So it did soak all the way through the grain. All right, so first up, let's look at this white oak. This is the thin coated side. Soak that up, wipe it down. And I'm just really looking for two things. I wanna see if there's a visible difference and then I wanna feel if there's a tactile difference. Can I feel raised grain, which is a sign of absorption of water? So there's a little bit of darkening. I do think that would change as any moisture that's been absorbed evaporates and dries. And I do feel a little bit of raised grain in here, not a tremendous amount, and that may calm down with drying as well, but it definitely did absorb a little bit of moisture. Let's check the flooded side. Okay, now this one, let's see, I'm trying to look at different angles. I actually don't see the darkening quite as much, but I definitely do feel raised grain in that area. So that's interesting. I don't see the water stain quite as well. But again, I think once all the water evaporates, any color changes, they're gonna be minimal at that point. But I do feel some raised grain there too. Okay, let's check the long grain cutting board. Okay, it's looking pretty good. I mean, gosh, it's hard to see. I really don't feel much in the way of raised grain. There's like a little mark there. I could barely detect it with my fingers, but there's not much to speak of. Let's check the flooded side. Yeah, same thing. I could just barely feel it with my fingers. And I think in both cases, I really can't see anything. There's no visible marks, but both sides did a real good job of repelling that moisture. Let's check the end grain. All right, thin application side first. Okay, I do see a stain there. Definitely a visible watermark. And I do feel it with my finger. 
It's not so much raised grain. What I actually feel, it's kind of interesting, is the glue line. I could feel the glue sitting up on the surface. If you ever made a new cutting board and put it to use the first time, a lot of times it can be disappointing after it gets wet the first time, where you start to feel those glue joints show themselves, which is kind of the nature of the beast. But it definitely absorbed a little bit of water, and I do see a little water staining, but for the most part, it did its job. Check the flooded side. Okay, I do feel a little bit with my finger, a little raised grain. Same thing with the glue lines. I could feel the glue lines, but I don't really feel a substantial difference between the, the flooded and the thin applied side. There's a visible mark and raised grain. So very similar. All right, so is that absolutely irrefutable evidence for what I'm trying to say? No, it was just one quick test to give you an idea of why I hold the opinion that I hold and why I think you're better served with thin coats versus flooding. So what about all the labels here? The instructions that tell you to flood, are they being you know, deceptive? What, what's the reason they're doing that? I don't know, I don't work for these companies. I don't know why they settled in on that being the application method they recommend, but it is what it is. I will say, Tried and True is one company that does seem to get it. They not only recommend on the back of the can that you apply thin, but they apply an extra sticker on the top that reminds you apply very thin coats because I guess if you work for one of those companies, it probably sucks getting the same calls and emails from people complaining who are having problems. And that's an effort to try to fix that. Now, I don't think we should you know, necessarily distrust these companies. In particular, I like these companies. I work with them, great people, no issues with them at all. But I will say when it comes to woodworking stuff, right? all the different things we interact with as woodworkers, the companies we work with, there's one area that through the years has proven time and time again to be somewhat distrustful and that's the world of finishing. In a lot of cases, it's actually the bigger companies, not some of these smaller makers. The bigger companies will put a label on the can that says it's one thing and it's actually something else. They really try to obscure these things to get you to pick that can and take it home and put it on your project. But you don't necessarily know what it is until you read the ingredients list. Sometimes you have to read the application instructions because a lot of times that's a giveaway to what's in the can. We could have a whole nother video just on that stuff. So is this really something they're doing maliciously? I don't know, but I can definitely say over the years, I've learned to not trust those instructions. And often, even though I'll tell you guys, hey, read the instructions, that's always a good baseline. When it comes to finishes, a lot of times, ignore the instructions and talk to other woodworkers about it. And you'll usually get better advice that way. So just an interesting thing. And again, don't wanna throw anybody under the bus. These are awesome companies. Um, I do think that they could use some adjustment to their instructions, but that's just my opinion. All right, thanks for watching everybody. See you next time. Do 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 do. Jeez, I think I just choked on my own uvula. Uh, but we limited its. Okay, that's me punching myself.